thanks for listening to Season 2 of the Matt Lubu Podcast. For this season, I'll be posting supplementary materials on my website, mattlupu.com. There, you can find maps, photos, and more to go along with each episode. Check out the entry for this episode. It's up right now. Once again, you can find it all at mattlupu.com. And now, on to the show. Last time, we explored the earliest evidence for the Slavs in Europe. If you'll recall, we examined a curious document dated to the 9th century which told us about the first contact between a distinct people known as the Rus in the court of Louis the Pious. They had come on a mission from the Byzantine emperor Theophilus and were headed back to their homeland in the far northern reaches of Europe. Our anonymous historian claimed that they were Swedish in origin. You'll also recall in the last episode, I mentioned the so-called Normanist controversy in Rus scholarship. This controversy revolves around how Scandinavian versus how Slavic the Rus actually were. The reason to believe that they were primarily Slavic comes from a few historical accounts, the most important of which is called the Rus Primary Chronicle. This document was written in the 12th century but deals with the foundations of some of the largest and most important Rus cities several centuries previous to that. The Rus Primary Chronicle is a fascinating read. It begins immediately after the biblical flood, seeking to explain the ancient origins of the Slavic people in a decidedly Christian context. For example, it traces the lineage of the Slavs to the third son of Noah, Japheth, and claims that the Slavs settled their lands soon after the overthrow of the Tower of Babel. Additionally, all dates given in the Chronicle are reckoned from the biblical creation. From the outset, it's obvious that we are dealing with a document far removed from the events it purports to describe. That information is telling and useful in its own way. Because the Chronicle is particularly interested in the different subcategories of Slavs, at first glance, one might suspect that the Rus at the time of its writing saw themselves as purely of Slavic descent. For example, the first city mentioned in the chronicle is Novgorod, which it says was founded by Slavs. This description is followed almost immediately after with the story of the foundation of Kiev. Apparently, there were three brothers named Ki, Shek, and Korev. Each one lived on his own hill, but they all decided to found a town on Key's Hill. The town was named Kiev in his honor. After the founding of Kiev, the chronicle tells us that in the reign of the Byzantine emperor Heraclius, a group of Scythians called Bulgars, along with another group called the Avars, came to Slav lands and oppressed them. This would have been in the early 7th century, if we are to trust the account. The Vikings don't appear in the Rus Chronicle until a little bit later. In 859, the Varangians, those are the Vikings, came from beyond the sea and imposed tribute on certain groups of Slavs, while the Khazars did the same to other groups of related Slavs elsewhere. Now, we should take a moment here to talk a little bit about some of the names that reappear over and over throughout this story. Firstly, I've been using the term Rus to refer to the ancestors of the modern Ukrainian and Russian people. There are a couple of theories about the origins of the name Rus. One says that it came from the Old Norse word rother, which referred to rowing, while the other states that it came from the term rothin, which was an older name for the Swedish coastal region of Roslagen. Incidentally, the first Norse word, rother, is probably where the Proto-Finnic name for Sweden, or Rosti, comes from. Now, as for the term Varangian, that also seems to come from Old Norse, Veiringi, meaning a sworn companion or ally. Both of these terms are equivalent to our word Viking, 
meaning that they both refer to people originally from the east coast of Sweden who made sea voyages of trade and conquest to various parts of the world in the 9th and 10th centuries. Now as for the Khazars, I've said that name several times in this series, but I still haven't introduced them formally. They seem to have been a multi-ethnic confederation of steppe nomads, not unlike the group that we call the Hun, led by their famous general Attila, who fought against the Romans in the 5th century. The Khazars probably were led by a Turkic elite who dominated their Avar, Slav, and other clients militarily. Some scholars have estimated the total number of distinct ethnicities in the Khazar state to be anywhere from 25 to 28. The subject tribes would have been bound to pay their masters in gold or in manpower for military adventures. Like many other Turkic groups, the Khazars would have adopted a dual kingship system, whereby a junior king, called the Bek, or Shad, controlled the military, while their senior king, called the Khan, would have held a religious and symbolic role. The junior king could only enter into the presence of the great king barefoot and prostrated himself before the great Khan waiting to be summoned. Supposedly, the Khazar Khan was selected by the nobility, and in his initiation ritual was strangled nearly to death until he declared the number of years he would like to reign. When the number of years was given, the nobility kept track and killed him when the time had elapsed. Real Conan the Barbarian stuff. Part of the reason that I like to make podcasts like this, aside from the inevitable fame and fortune that comes with recording a comprehensive history of the Rus, you know, everyone's favorite topic, is that in researching my topic, I inevitably find fascinating surprises. The Khazars are no different. You see, apparently, the Khazars converted to Judaism at some point in the 8th or 9th century. The account comes to us from several sources, One particularly important source is a journal kept by the 10th century Muslim traveler Ibn Fadlan. He was sent as part of a delegation from Caliph al-Muqtadr in Baghdad to the Volga Bulgars, which meant traveling through Khazar territory. Much of what we know about the Khazar Khan comes from Ibn Fadlan. Now as for the Khazars being Jews, he simply says, The Khazars and their king are all Jews. End quote. Ibn Rusta, a Persian geographer, astronomer, explorer, and historian who wrote in the early 10th century, confirms this account. I must confess at this point that I mention Ibn Fadlan and Ibn Rusta not just because of their reports of Khazar Judaism, as unexpected as that was for me, but because both authors had contact with the Rus and provide us with information about the state of Rus and Slav relations at the time. Their accounts, as well as the accounts of other Arab and Persian travelers, will perhaps shed some additional light on how the Rus developed into a distinct polity. But before we get to them, why don't we read the Rus Primary Chronicles account of the origins of the Rus people. Here's what it says. The tributaries of the Varangians drove them back beyond the sea, and, refusing them further tribute, set out to govern themselves. There was no law among them, but tribe rose against tribe. Discord thus ensued among them, and they began to war one against the other. They said to themselves, Let us seek a prince who may rule over us and judge us according to the law. They accordingly went overseas to the Varangian Ruses. These particular Varangians were known as Ruses, just as some are called Swedes and other Normans, English, and Gotlanders, for thus they were named. The Chuds, the Slavs, the Kravitians, and the Ves then said to the people of the Rus, Our land is great and rich, but there is no order in it. Come to rule and reign over us. They thus selected three brothers with their kinsfolk, who took with them all the Ruses and migrated. The oldest, Rurik, located himself in Novgorod. The second, Sineas, at Beluzero, and the third, Truvor, in Izbrosk. On account of these Varangians, the district of Novgorod became known as the Land of the Rus. The present inhabitants of Novgorod are descended from the Varangian race, but aforetime, they were Slavs. Perhaps you can see the problem here. 
The Rus' primary chronicle seems not to understand the exact relationship between the Slavs and the Vikings. On the one hand, the Slavs drove the Varangians out of their land, but on the other hand, they asked for them to come back and rule over them. The people living in Novgorod at the time were descended from the Vikings, but before that they were Slavs. The confusion continues when the chronicle attempts to explain how the city of Kiev factors into this story. It says, With Rurik, there were two men who did not belong to his kin, but were boyars. Those are warlords, by the way. They obtained permission to go to Tsargrad, that's Constantinople, with their families. They thus sailed down the Dnieper, and in the course of their journey they saw a small city on a hill. Upon their inquiry as to whose town it was, they were informed that three brothers, Ki, Shek, and Koriv, had once built the city, but that since their deaths, their descendants were living there as tributaries of the Khazards. Askold and Deer remained in the city, and after gathering together many Varangians, they established their dominion over the country of the Polyanians, at the same time that Rurik was ruling at Novgorod. If we're to take the primary chronicle at its word, then the Slavs were subject to both the Khazars and the Varangians at one point. This idea seems to be supported by the report that we looked at last time, the one written by the anonymous analyst of Louis the Pious, who mentioned that the Rus, who had come to court, had a king called the Chakanus, which probably is a reference to the Khazar Khan. The evidence of a Turkic, or perhaps ancient Scythian influence on the early Rus state gets stronger when we read Ibn Fadlan's account of a Rus funeral that he observed on his trip up the Volga River. The following is his account of the funeral of a Rus nobleman. When a great man dies, the member of his family say to his slave girls and young slave boys, which of you will die with him? One of them replies, I will. Once they have spoken, it is irreversible and there is no turning back. If they wanted to change their mind, they would not be allowed to. Usually, it is the slave girls who offer to die. When the man whom I mentioned above died, they said to his slave girls, Who will die with him? One of them answered, I will. And they appointed two young slave girls to watch over her and follow her everywhere she went, sometimes even washing her feet with their own hands. Everyone busies himself about the dead man, cutting out clothes for him and preparing everything that he will need. Meanwhile, the slave girl spends each day drinking and singing happily and joyfully, when the day came that the man was to be burned and the girl with him, I went to the river where his boat was anchored. I saw that they had drawn his boat up onto the shore, and that four posts of kadank or other wood had been driven into the ground, and round these posts a framework of wood had been erected. Next, they drew up the boat until it rested on this wooden construction. Then they came forward, coming and going, pronouncing words that I did not understand, while the man was still in his grave. Then they brought a bed, and placed it on the boat, and covered it with a mattress, and cushions of Byzantine silk brocade. Then came an old woman whom they call the Angel of Death, and she spread the bed with coverings we have just mentioned. She is in charge of sewing and arranging all these things, and it is she who kills the slave girls. I saw that she was a witch, thick-bodied and sinister. When they came to the tomb of the dead man, they removed the earth from on top of the wood, and then the wood itself, and they took out the dead man, wrapped in the garment in which he died. I saw that he had turned black because of the coldness of the country. They had put nabid. This is an Arab word that is probably equivalent to beer, as nabid is a drink of partially fermented grapes or dates, that is typically non-alcoholic, since alcohol is forbidden in Islam. They had put it on the tomb, with him, and fruit, and a drum. They took all this out. The dead man did not smell bad, and nothing about him had changed except his color. They dressed him in trousers, socks, boots, a tunic, and a brocade caftan with gold buttons. On his head they placed a brocade cap covered with sable, then they bore him into the pavilion on the boat and sat him on the mattress, supported by cushions. 
Then they brought nabid, fruit, and basil, which they placed near him. Next they carried in bread, meat, and onions, which they laid before him. Meanwhile, the slave girl who wanted to be killed came and went, entering in turn each of the pavilions that had been built. And the master of each pavilion had intercourse with her, saying, Tell your master that I only did this for your love of him. On Friday, when the time had come for the evening prayer, they led the slave girl towards something which they had constructed and which looked like the frame of a door. She took off two bracelets that she was wearing and gave them both to the old woman who is known as the Angel of Death, she who was to kill her. Then she stripped off her two anklets and gave them to the two young girls who served her. They were the daughters of the woman called the Angel of Death. Then the men lifted her onto the boat, but did not let her enter the pavilion. Next, men came with shields and staves. They handed the girl a cup of nabit. She sang a song over it and drank. The interpreter translated what she was saying and explained that she was bidding all her female companions farewell. Then they gave her another cup. She took it and continued singing for a long time, while the old woman encouraged her to drink, and then urged her to enter the pavilion and join her master. I saw that the girl did not know what she was doing. She wanted to enter the pavilion, but she put her head between it and the boat. Then the old woman seized her head, made her enter the pavilion, and went in with her. The men began to bang on their shields with staves to drown her cries, so that the other slave girls would not be frightened and try to avoid dying with their masters. Next, six men entered the pavilion and lay with the girl one after another, after which they laid her beside her master. Two seized her feet, and two others her hands. The old woman called the Angel of Death came and put a cord around her neck in such a way that the two ends went in opposite directions. She gave the ends to two of the men, so that they could pull on them. Then she herself approached the girl, holding in her hand a dagger with a broad blade, and plunged it again and again between the girl's ribs, while the two men strangled her with the cord until she was dead. After this delightful ceremony, the boat was burned, and a mound was heaped up on the spot, topped by a wooden post that listed the name of the Rus leader. Scholars have typically held up this account as an example of how Nordic or Viking the Rus must have been. However, challenges to that interpretation have recently come to the fore. Since, modern scholarship has noted important differences between this ceremony and what is otherwise known about Norse funeral practice and religion. For example, in Ibn Fadlan's version, the slave girl describes paradise as green and beautiful. But there is no such Norse or Scandinavian description of Valhalla, and we have no evidence that any women were allowed to enter Valhalla in the first place, let alone slave women. Furthermore, there are elements of this ceremony that bear a striking resemblance to Herodotus' description of elite Scythian burial. Here's what Herodotus has to tell us, writing a thousand years before Ibn Fadlan's description. I've taken the liberty of translating the Greek. There are tombs of kings in Geri at the end of the navigation of the Borosenthes. That's the ancient Greek name for the Dnieper River. There, whenever their king has died, they dig a great four-cornered pit in the ground. When this is made ready, they take up the corpse, the body enclosed in wax, his belly cut open and cleansed and filled with pulverized nut sedge and embalming plants and parsley and anise seed, and sewn up again and carry him off in a wagon to another tribe. Then those that would receive the body, once he has arrived, do the same as do the royal Scythians. They cut off a part of their ears, shave their heads, make cuts around their arms, tear their foreheads and noses, and pierce their left hands with arrows. From there, they carry the king's body on the wagon to another tribe whom they rule, and the ones they have already come to follow them. When they have carried around the corpse to all, they are in the land of Geri, the farthest distant of the tribes under their rule, and at the place of their burial. At that point, they would lay the corpse in a grave on a mattress of rushes. After fixing spears on both sides of the body, they lay logs across them, and then they cover them with wicker. In the remaining open space of the tomb, they bury, after strangling them, 
one of the king's concubines, his cupbearer, his cook, his groom, his squire, and his messenger, and horses, and all the other sacrificial offerings in golden bowls. But the Scythians do not use silver or bronze. After doing this, they all build up a great mound, competing and desiring to make it as big as possible. Once a year has passed, they do the following. Taking the trustiest of the rest of the king's servants, and these servants are native-born Scythians, for only those serve the king whom he himself orders to do, and none of the Scythians have servants bought by money. They strangle fifty of these servants and fifty of their best horses, taking out their stomachs and cleansing the bellies of them all. They stuff them with straw and sew them up. Then they set up half of a wheel on two logs, the hollow part facing up, and the other half to another pair of logs, till many logs are planted in the ground in the same way. Then, driving thick stakes lengthwise through the horses' bodies to their necks, they mount them on the wheels, so that the wheel in front supports the horse's shoulders, and the wheel behind bears the belly, and the thighs, and both sets of legs hang in mid-air. Sliding bits in the horses' mouths, they stretch the bridles to the front, and mount them with pegs. Then they mount each one of the fifty strangled young men on a horse, mounting them in the following way. They would drive a straight log through each corpse up to the throat, but enough of the log projects below to be fixed in a hole made in the other stake, that which passes through the horse. Setting up the horsemen in a circle around the tomb in this way, they ride away. Damn. Metal. So what do we make of all this? I like to think that at this point in the 9th century, we should think of the Rus as a loose confederation of Slavs, some of whom have adopted Khazar ways, led by charismatic Viking leaders, or perhaps even a Viking elite class that has settled in their midst. The Vikings came in search of slaves and silver, no doubt taking many Slavs with them to sell to other peoples on their long sea voyages. They probably built strongholds for this kind of activity, places like Kiev, Novgorod, and Ladoga. The local population probably did business with these fortified places, forging military and economic alliances. As a result, over the course of a few generations, a new cultural milieu arose, which we might call the Rus. Next time, we will follow this new group of people on their journey to local domination, and maybe we can learn a little bit more about their new capital city, Kiev. Thanks for listening.